Hello, everybody. This is Mike Nelson, the Mike Nelson Show. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure to subscribe right now. Today, I've got a really cool guest. I got John Karabi. How are you doing today, John? I'm good. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. So, when did your whole musical journey begin, John? Can you tell me about that? Say, say this when again. When did your now? musical journey begin? When did it all kick off for you in terms oh, of music? God. Uh, it actually all started in like third or fourth grade of, of uh, grade school. I was in a talent show and I had a band, uh, you know, friends, and we literally did House of the Rising Sun and I'm Not Your Stepping Stone by the Monkees. And we won the contest. My dad took us out for pizza afterwards. And I just had a room full of people give us a standing ovation. And I'm like, mm, I'm sold. You know, so that was it. Free pizza and a standing ovation. I'll do anything. <laughs> there you go. So who specifically do you think inspired you to sing? Is there like a singer out there, you know, that maybe inspired you specifically? I, I would have to say, like, very early on, um, I well, I think like anybody else, uh, my era, my generation, it was the Beatles. Um, but I, I just remember trying to mimic like Paul McCartney singing Oh Darling, um, you know, just some of those great classic Beatles songs. And then a little later, it was more like, uh, I mean, there's. I obviously I have a huge list of people that are inspired me, but um, I would have to say after the Beatles and Paul McCartney, it was probably the two biggest were Steven Tyler of Aerosmith and Robert Plant. And when did you start like, yeah. And when, yeah. And <laughs> when did you start like your first band? When, when was that? Was this in high school or, you know, you went to high school in the seventies, right? So what, what was this, the, the, the beginning of like your first band? Um, well, my first real band, I started with my first wife's brother. Um, and we were doing cover songs, just trying to break into the Philadelphia, New Jersey, Maryland kind of club scene at the time in the seventies. So we were doing all this cool, like, uh, you know, Rod Stewart, Rainbow, uh, Sabbath, uh, obviously Zeppelin, Aerosmith, um, whatever. Uh, that was probably, I was probably 16, 17 years old trying to get into the club scene. Um, but my first band was that one that I just told you about in the talent show. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I was, I don't know, 11, 10, <laughs> something like go. that. Wow. Yeah. Now, I read in your bio that you eventually, of course, moved to L.A. in the 1980s. Can you give me more insight on, you know, how that whole happened, that, that move to, of course, uh, maybe the center of, of rock and roll, of course, in the 80s? Yeah, you know, it it it, it was weird. In Philadelphia, um, doing the cover scene, if you were kind of more in the in the genre of what they called new wave at the time uh, and original, so you you had tons of places to play. Um, there was people coming up in this in the Philly market, like obviously Hall and Oates, whatever. But I'm talking about uh, bands like the Hooters. Um, there was another guy, Robert Hazard and the Heroes. But for original rock stuff, um, like I tried to I write my own stuff. Tom Kiefer was another one. He was writing uh, original rock. And there really wasn't many places to play. Uh, we played at a place called the Empire Rock Room. We And another place was the Galaxy. And... Um, after that, like, uh, it, it, it's funny. So there, there, that was the two places you could play in Philadelphia, really, for original rock music. Um, I had a buddy that went out, a guy named Johnny D, who eventually became the drummer of Britney Fox, was playing drums with me. He went on vacation to California, 
and came back and he's like, dude, it's chicks and dudes with palm tree hair everywhere you look. There's hundreds of clubs to play original rock and roll music. So my wife and I took a, we took a trip out to uh, LA, checked it out, fell in love with it. And then over the course of like a year, year and a half, we all one by one, the band that I was in, we all decided to move out to LA and just give it a go out there. Um, oddly enough, right after I moved about, I don't know, five months or so after I moved, Tom Kiefer wound up getting a sign, you know, but John Bon Jovi discovered him and uh, walked him into Polygram and they got a record deal and just about every hard rock original band in Philadelphia got a record deal. And I was out driving for Hertz rent a car in LA wow. <laughs> trying to get a record deal. So it, it was just weird how it worked out, but it worked out for everybody nonetheless. And uh, that, that was, I moved out to LA in 1980 five or six so pretty crazy now eventually you formed the scream and you guys recorded an album do you guys think you recorded that album uh, a little bit too late you know the glam era was kind of ending uh can you talk to me about that how how music was kind of changing of course in, in that period right yeah you know what's weird is i didn't pay much mind to it then uh i do remember going to england and my bass player at the time, Juan Alderetti, uh was just like, we saw Nirvana in this little club. They did two shows one night and Juan just was like, uh, dude, this isn't good. Like these, this is, this is gonna, you, you know what I mean? He kind of had the foresight to see that Nirvana was gonna change a lot of things. Um. But even still, I don't really think like the Scream wasn't really a band that was like we weren't like glam. Uh, we didn't really fit into a lot of different categories, so we weren't real worried about it, you know. And then, as it turned out, the thing that the thing that ended the Scream was the phone call I got from Motley. So it was it was weird. Um, you know, but I didn't really, we, like, I, I still don't think now to this day, like, everything happens for a reason. I really, truly believe that. Um, you know, the scream may, may have weathered the storm. Who knows? You know what I mean? But uh, everything worked out the way it's supposed to work out. Now, talk to me about that call you got from Motley Crue. Were you surprised by that, you know, as a musician back in those days? Uh, yes. Uh, only for the simple reason that, um, I mean, I knew who Motley was, um, but the fact that I was on their radar for something like that was kind of blew me away. But the funny thing is, and they kind of figured this out later, like I wasn't a massive fan of a lot of stuff that happened in the eighties. My, wheelhouse was the 70s stuff like the deep purples and led zeppelins and aerosmith and rod stewart and the stones and you know so um didn't quite get you know i i, I didn't quite get a lot of things that a lot of the bands were doing in the 80s i was like eh, whatever um so when they called me it was a shock and then it was funny. I was in the band like two years. We we're getting ready to go on tour. And Tommy and Nikki said, Hey dude, like what, what, what do you want to sing? What do you feel comfortable singing for the set? And I was like, uh, well, can I, can I get your records so I could, you know, listen to them and I I'll get back to you on that. And they were dumbfounded. They were like, so you don't have any of our records. <laughs> No. Then Tommy goes, have you ever seen us play live before? And I'm like, no. Wow. And, you know, so it was just one of those weird things. But 
you know, I wrote a book and it's called Horseshoes and Hand Grenades because I'm the king of being at the right place, but always at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you when you joined the band there in 92, what, what was the state of the other guys? Were, were, you know, they, of course, just gotten rid of Vince Neil. Um, what was going on? Was was it kind of a tough time going on for Motley Crue in those days or how was it? No, they were, you know, once we started jamming, they were like, I, I think that they were just reliving everything through me. Um, you know, like every time something would happen, like a helicopter would land in Tommy's backyard and Tommy and I would go to a wedding in a helicopter. So I was just like, holy shit, this is crazy. You know, um, so I think there was a, they were uh, rejuvenated or, or refreshed with my attitude about a lot of things. So um, uh, it, it, it was cool. You know, um, we were excited about the music we were writing. You know, everybody was just playing their ass off and we were just constantly writing every day. And um, it was just exciting. So overall, you felt like you fit in with the guys then as soon as you kind of joined the band. Uh, yeah, it took me about a week, you know what I mean? Just to feel uncomfortable around them. But um, it was pretty immediate. And they were they definitely welcomed me in the beginning with open arms. You know what I mean? So it was pretty cool. How did, how did you feel with, with the fan support? Like, you know, doing the shows. Do you think you were well received by the fans looking back fan on it? Yeah, the fans that were there were there to support. So I didn't really see much um, negative shit. It was just the fact that tickets weren't selling. You know, they went like, you know, <laughs> they went from selling out like, you know, 10, 15,000 seat places, you know, to selling 4,000 tickets, 5,000 tickets, 3,000 tickets. Um, some markets less. So it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a shock for everybody, but we got through it. We did what we could. And, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, wait, where'd you go? Are you, oh, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit of a shock, but we got through it. It was cool. Now, do you think you were selling less tickets because of, of uh, you know, just the the nineties? The music, of course, was, was not what Molly Crew was no longer. I guess you know was still relevant, but was no longer on the radio as much anymore. Is that why you guys weren't selling tickets? It was a combination of there was so much weird stuff going on. Everybody at a record label got fired, so there was nobody to promote the record. Uh, the music radio stations were playing you know all the new stuff the nirvana soundgarden pearl jam alice in chains uh you know there was that mtv pulled the plug on us because nikki literally threatened to pummel one of the guys with a mic stand because he took offense to a question a guy asked um you know so it was just it was just it was just the whole situation was weird so um, it is, like I said, it is what it is. Now, we've all seen the movie The Dirt. How accurate is that movie, do you think? You know, you, of course, you came at a different period. But was it still pretty crazy back in those days for Molly Crew? Yeah, it was, it was insanity. It was <laughs> definitely drama and insanity all the time, which I have said in my book, like, as bummed out as I was that they brought Vince back, I was also relieved that I didn't have to deal with their shit anymore. So it was all good. Now with what's, with what's going on right now with Vic Mars, was there already some animosity with the other three guys? Did you feel something was going on or, or were they all really tied back in those days? You know what? Here's, here's my answer, dude. I have no idea. Mick is not returning anybody's calls and I don't talk to Tommy, Nikki or, you know, Tommy, Nikki, or Vince. So, but none of it surprises me. None of it. So I, I don't really have an answer other than that. You know what I mean? 
Now, ultimately, you said uh, you were bummed, of course, that Vince came back to the band. Did you feel while you were in the band that that Vince would come back? Or do you, do you think, was that, were you not even thinking about that? Were you just enjoying your time with Molly Crew? Wasn't thinking about it. But, you know, it was always floating in the back of my head that, you know, it's like anything, you know, you argue with your girlfriend and you split up and, you know, you start start dating other people and then you realize the girlfriend wasn't all that bad after all, whatever. Um, I think that they liked, I think that they liked the fact that I could write and play guitar and all those things. But, um, you know, I think they also realized that the fans wanted Vince. Pretty simple. Now with bands such as like Molly Crew or even like Kiss, are you surprised that these bands still are able to fill up stadiums and the success that they have even all these years later? Are you surprised by that? No. No. I, I, the fans are there. You know, and a lot of the fans that, you know, now they're older, they've got expendable money. They want to go to a show. They they would go to a show, you know, but all the, the fans are always there. You know, the 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 thing that's weird now is radio isn't <laughs> MTV isn't, but the fans are always there. So you put something like this together and it's just a bunch of 50 year olds reliving their their teen years again. So. It doesn't surprise me at all. Now let's talk about the Dead Daisies. Of course, you, you guys have some shows coming up. Can you tell me you know, how you're feeling about that with the Dead Daisies project that you got going on right now? I love it, dude. It's, uh, you know, we're all friends. We've all known each other for 10, 15, 20 years. I've known Doug for even longer. Um, you know, but we all respect each other, the way they play, uh, each other, the way we play and sing and um you know, it's, I'm just excited to be back. You know, I was there before and then I left for a few years and now I'm back and uh, we've got a best of record coming out uh, August 18th. And, um, you know, it's it's kind of a, a 10 year marker like, hey, here's what we did. Here's where we're going. And uh, it's just going to be fun to get out and jam with my buddies again. You know what I mean? And you guys got a pretty uh, special show coming up in September at the Roxy, right, in L.A., legendary venue? Yes. Uh, just take me back to the old days of the Scream and the Angora and all that stuff. So, um, it, and, and I'll get to see some old friends and stuff when I'm back there. But uh, playing L.A. is always fun. Any, uh, any uh, special songs on the set list you think uh, fans will be surprised with that you can tell us? No, it's just, you know, we're, we're just, uh, we're just doing a little bit of material from throughout all the different records. And, uh, you know, I call it the fun circus, but we're bringing the fun circus back to the dead daisies and just getting out there and giving people their money's worth and kick their ass, put a smile on their face. And hopefully they can forget about all the bullshit that's in the news all day long. But, um, you know, we'll just go out and have some fun. Now, do you have any advice for uh, for singers or musicians out there? You've been doing this for a long time. Any advice for those young musicians out there? Get a day job. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what it used to be, kids. But you know what? If you believe in yourself and you love doing what you're doing, then just go at it wholeheartedly. Don't let anything get you down and don't take no for an answer. Just go. All right. I want to thank you, John, for your time. It was great talking to you. Awesome, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Remember to stay heavy.